His Excellency Ferit Hoxha, Ambassador, Permanent Representative of uh, Mission of Albania to the United Nations. Um, again, um, impressive resume. Uh, prior to this appointment, Mr. Hoxha served as a National Coordinator for the Alliance of Civilizations and National Coordinator for the Barcelona Process Union for the Mediterranean since 2008. He was appointed by his country's government to the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, Board of Governors in 2007. Between 2006 and 2009, he was Secretary General of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Mr. Hoxha has been personal representative of the Head of State to the Permanent Council of the International Organizations of La Francophonie from 2001 and 2007, during which uh, during which period he also served as ambassador to France until 2006 and again ambassador to France and ambassador to United Nations, same like um, our friend from Bulgaria. He was ambassador to Belgium and Luxembourg from 1999 to 2001 and currently head of Albania's mission to the European Union in Brussels, a position to which he, has appoint he was appointed in 1998. Uh, there is more to say about him, but let's not go into all of this. Um, he's married and he's got uh, two children. Let's finish with that. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. That's, 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 that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me say how pleased I am to be here and, and to, um, to have this opportunity. And thank you really for this platform. I know this is the second series that you organize about the um, relations of the European Union with um, the Western Balkans, or as we call and prefer to call it Southeast Europe, but both mean a little bit the same thing. Um, it is a good platform to really see where we are, what we can do, what has been done, if we've done well, and, and how can we uh, accelerate this, um, um, uh, this process. Um, I'm sorry I was late, but I can assure you I was not dead. <laughs> um, so I will try to um, take probably less time than Stefan did, some 10 to, um, to, uh, to, to 12 minutes, and dwell on four questions. The first one, where we are, so what Albania has been doing with the European Union in uh, the last two decades. Um, so how much we really believe that the process is delivering. So what's the situation today and the mood more than situation in the European Union? So is that helping or not? And then I will jump to a number of conclusions uh, um, to, uh, to which I think uh, we, we, we stand today. Um, I would have said also that I'm very pleased to see uh, my peer colleagues here from Macedonia and from Kosovo. And of course, uh, their presentations will enrich and complement because uh, out of Bulgaria, which is a, num a member state now, all the three countries are members of the uh, so-called stabilization and association process. And with this, the SAP, I'd like to say that um, this is the hat that we have, that all countries of the Southeast Europe have today. So we are part of a process that was initiated in um, Zagreb in 2000. In 2000, it's a long, long time ago, that was enshrined in the so-called Thessaloniki Declaration, where the EU and the Balkan states signed a document. And for that, um, in that document, for the first time, we were promised full membership. And that's an important element because we have two decades of relations with Europe at various levels and there are plenty of things that I would say because every year something has happened. But the real commitment that was made was in Thessaloniki. So at that time, Europe was convinced that there is no other way for the Balkans than to really prepare them, help them, and believe in the trust and the commitment that they have that they should join the European Union. And it has been from that day and, and now on a conviction of us, of ours, of our countries and our people and our governments and the society as a whole, that there is no other way. Either we join the European Union or then we go back to what everybody um, uh, fears, which is not war or tensions, but it's lagging behind in terms of reforms, in terms of advancement, peace, prosperity. Europe has shown that it is, um, Stefan, said that um, Europe is the most important project in a in century. I would say pr Europe, European Union, is the biggest, the brightest, the most fantastic and wonderful um, project um, uh, Europe has ever had. Uh, and if we look in the history, there are less bright moments than, than, than this one. And it has ensured 
three things. First of all, it has united everyone in purpose and action. Second, it has created an open area of free movement, ideas and capitals. So these are the, the, the basic um, uh, principles of the European Union. But it has created an area of peace and prosperity. The more the European Union has enlarged, the prosper the people and the area has become. So it's just natural for all our countries to really try, do everything we can to be part of that um, of that um, uh, area. I will not read my statement either, but I'll refer to it uh, a little bit. Um, so where we are now, after two decades of um, cooperation with the um, European Union at various levels, uh, the biggest thing that we have achieved is visa liberalization. That's one thing fundamental, because that, for the first time, opened really the doors of the European Union to our citizens. We very much hope that that will be the case also with, with um, Kosovo and, and the Kosovars because they deserve that, because they are no less good citizens than everybody else in the region. And, and we very much hope that uh, more political than, than technical um, reasoning will, um, will prevail to really um, make the region completely visa-free because that's extremely important. When people meet, when narratives, different narratives, especially from the part of the world that has suffered so harshly during history, they really have uh, discovered that they have a lot in common. So this was the first achievement that we had. And the second achievement was the signing and ratification and the entry into force of the Stabilization and Social Agreement, which is the legal contractual relationship that we have nowadays with the European Union. That opens the way to candidate status and candidate status opens the way to uh, negotiations for um, accession. So in 2009, my country applied under the Czech, Repu uh, Czech uh, Republic presidency of the EU at that time to become a member in accordance with the uh, so-called Copenhagen criteria. Um, it seemed that we were a little bit too quick to really apply immediately after the entry into force of the agreement. Uh, because for three years the Commission was not convinced, they gently said us that we need to do more, that we needed to make more efforts to combat corruption and to, um, to have a, um, a, a, um, a more peaceful running in the political um, discourse and of course uh, more reforms. Now when we look, all this is true and we do not really contest, we were not happy, but then we have a partner and we have to deal with that partner. But when we look back two decades of cooperation since to 1992. Um, it's a long time. And we get the impression sometimes that the more you do, the more they ask. That's good in one sense because uh, that is always invested as, um, as, as um, a development and advancement in the country. But then you need a lot, a hell of a patience, really, politically, socially, to really go through um, a, a process that can look sometimes never ending. Um, we know that where it should end, we know and are con confident that it will end, but has it become more easy? And this is where my second point com comes. So where is Europe vis-a-vis -vis enlargement? Um, if one has been reading about what's happening in Europe in the last two years, one has heard a lot of worrying statements that after Croatia we need to make a pause, because the union is becoming too big, because we need to make reforms, because, uh, you know, institutions are not easy, so we need to know where we go. So um, we will kindly ask Albania and, 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 and Bosnia and Macedonia and, and Serbia and Montenegro and Kosovo to wait a little bit. I mean, they've been waiting, so they know that. They are really professional in waiting, so a little bit of more is not a problem. Um, well, we, don't, we do not see that um, in, in, the, in this way, because we think that, um, Although we have matured, although we have learned a lot, um, we think that there is no other as powerful as a driving force as the European Union perspective. It is really the motor of, of, of facilitating um, um, reforms and really bringing our countries not closer to the European Union, that's one target, but closer to where we want to be, closer to where the citizens want to be, closer to the dream of those who really um, fought hard to, uh, to change our countries, 
uh, from from a dictatorship at last at least in the case of Albania one of the most harshest most brutal most criminal regimes in the uh, um, eastern Europe to a uh, open society a free society a society that develops like the rest of of, of Europe but we learned all the way that it, this is not easy it needs a lot a lot of efforts and sometimes it needs also to overcome to what again my colleague from the EU and Bulgaria, Stefan, mentioned some prejudices. So all, all these countries ready, are we importing societies that are ready to really become part of us or are we also importing problems? Should we all wait to really see the, the region completely transformed, completely pacified with, so that we do not import uh, problems? On, on that aspect, um, I think um, the region has matured. Our countries cooperate in a completely different atmosphere. Um, we have um, a network of s over 70 different agreements between countries of um, more than 70 different regional initiatives to which uh, our countries are, are um, part of. Um, and, and, and that has prepared us. But nothing more than the appeal of becoming part of the European Union has really driven reforms because it has made it easy for the political class to take uh, sometimes hard uh, and, and difficult decisions. It has maintained that, that enthusiasm that is absolutely needed in, 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 in the population at large. So what's the mood today in the EU? Um, I think big countries are a little bit worried that they do not really want to continue with enlargement immediately. I'm not saying that it will be stopped, but we are uh, anxious to really and listen to everything that is said here and there uh, at every level, that we need this process to continue because this is extremely important, as, as, as I said. Of course, um, Europe has been in crisis. Economies have been down since, since more than five years now. Um, the more time passes, the younger generations are less linked to the history of creation of the European Union and this big pacification of, of Europe from hundreds of years of war. And then, of course, when you feel bad at home, you don't really invite people. So, so all this together really makes it more difficult for our countries to, uh, to, to, uh, to convince, uh, to convince um, uh, our partners. Just one example, Albania should have had the candidate status in December last time. But there were a couple of countries who said that, look, I mean, we need more time because we have problems back home. We'll have elections in a couple of months. And even one country went uh, uh, all the way to have a resolution in the parliament to instruct the prime minister to say no, not no to Albania as such in the process, but no for this time. So our next appoint, our next um, big rendezvous will be in, in during the Greek presidency in June, and we very much hope that we will make it there. Um, it is uh, hopes are high, stakes are even higher, and 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 the importance is absolutely crucial. So let me um, really jump to, uh, to, the, to the conclusions and, and, and leave probably some more time for also discussion, which I would be uh, very grateful to, uh, to answer if I can uh, to any of your questions. So despite the mood that I briefly explained in, in the EU, we will not back off because we're not doing anything we do for the EU or for the sake of the integration. We do that for ourselves. If it can help us to get to the EU, that's even better. But we do it for ourselves, for our country, for our people, for our families, for our kids, and that's the most important thing. But again, we cannot fail into this process because that's the future. Um, so the target is to get candidate status in June and to open negotiations of accession immediately after, after that, uh, at least within, within the year. Um, our region has a very complex history, and we know that. And, um, and it has not completely been digested, uh, as it should. So, but, but we all have, have really matured, and we all um, look to the future. And, and if there was one example to really cite, it's what's happening today between two countries in the region, between Kosovo and, 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 and Serbia, that they are meeting as, as often as they can, and they are discussing um, very complex and important issues, and they're coming with, with, uh, with agreements. And even if they don't agree on all, of course, it means that they are really investing to a future which might be beneficial for all. So um, our countries will need the European Union because this is the matter, as I said. But the European Union needs us as well. If one looks at the map, we are just an island now. We are surrounded everywhere by European Union countries. The, the Union has invested in the region. And if it were only for the member states that border our region, 
they cannot afford to fail. They have invested so heavily, and it won't be good for any of the countries that we, if we um, continue to have <coughs> problems. Um, but of course, enlargement cannot drag forever. It has to be targeted, it has to be deliverable, and it has to be time, um, time, time framed as well, because enlargement fatigue, we understand, but there can be also reform fatigue, and that's very bad for our countries and very bad for our, for our society. My last conclusion, and probably my last word, is that we do not think that we should divide the region into tiers, that some countries are already negotiating and some others have to wait, and one country has waited far too long, and, and, and we know that. So we think that uh, negotiations should be open for every country, irrespective of how, if it takes 15 years for one country or 10 or 6 for one country, that's not a big problem. Because we know that when you negotiate, you really go into the heart, the real heart of the problems, and there is no other process that transforms the country, its institutions and its society than the real negotiation process. So this is the real win-win exercise, win-win, win for us, win for the European Union, win for everybody. And with this, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you very much uh, for this expose.